Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, we will begin our sixth faculty lecture. Um, so it's it's a it's an honor to welcome Dr. Hanita Kosher to UCLA and to our ISUSW program. Dr. Hanita Kosher is a faculty member at the Paul Bayerwald School of Social Work and Social Welfare at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem since 2016. Hanita's research and teachings focus on issues relating to children's rights with a special focus on children's right to participation and children well-being from their own perspective. Hanita also has vast experience working in the field as a social worker. In the last year, Hanita has been the director of Haruv USA, an international training center for professionals in the field of child maltreatment, located at the Anne and Henry Zero School of Social Work at the University of Oklahoma, Tulsa. So without further ado, we will welcome Dr. Hanita Kosher to begin her lecture. Thank you so much. Oh, Is that comfortable? Yeah. Okay, hi, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you today and to join the summer school. I will speak without the mask, I think it's better. Um, so I just want to say that this is not my first time in the summer uh, school of uh, social work because we in Israel hosted the summer school in 2018. So this is my second time in this wonderful uh, project. Um, so, um, start working, let me see. Okay, so I will use that, that's okay. Uh, I will not move, I was asked to stand here. So usually I'm more dynamic, but today I will stand here. So, um, thank you for the introduction. I will just maybe repeat and say that I have like several professional hats and the first and foremost, I'm a professional or what you call here, a licensed social worker. And my, uh, I will, I'm working in the field of uh, children rights advocacy. Uh, in, for the last 20 years, now you will know how old I am. I'm also a faculty member at the School of Social Work, but a very special experience that I have uh, I had in the last uh, year is to be the director of Harub USA Center, which uh, located in the University of Oklahoma, Tulsa. So we actually came here in the end of last August for one year, and we'll be back to Israel in a month, and that was a, an amazing, amazing experience. Um, so I'm going to speak with you today about social justice for children. And for me, social justice for children is to speak about children's rights. This is my main field of expertise. And I will want to do that by following three um, phases or, or three parts. Uh, first of all, I want to speak with you in general on the idea of children's rights and children's right to participation. We will go very early to the human history and try to understand when children's rights uh, was established. Then we'll speak about children's right to participation in the child welfare system that will be uh, connected to our work as social workers. And then I want to speak in general about social work and children's rights, or maybe social work and human rights. We have complicated, as social workers, we have complicated relationships uh, with human rights. I can tell you that I don't have any uh, colleague in Israel, uh, a social work colleague that I can work with in the area, uh, I mean, to do research together on children's rights, because children's rights is an area today that it's considered to be an area of lawyers. And this is very interesting. So that's why I'm very along in this field in the academia in Israel, uh, uh, in any case. So I want to start by showing you a short movie. I will call just, I don't want to mess up with the Zoom. Oh my 
like having to live as a boy was very bad until one day I told my mum and dad that I felt I was a girl and they accepted me. So they let me dress as a girl indoors so I could see if this was right for me. And that was good for me because my life was so much better and if they had not let me live as a girl, I would have been even more sad. After that, when they saw that this was truly who I was, they let me live outside as a girl as well. The Gender Identity Bill was dedicated to me. I felt really proud of that. That means trans people like me will have better rights. Now I am very happy living as a girl. I am Willa everywhere, when I'm at home and at school too. I'm fully respected as Willa, and that's what other trans kids need. We should just be allowed to live as we are, because we know who we are. Trans kids need to be listened to. We don't have a disorder, and you can't change us. We are who we are. I forget to tell you something. I really will be happy that we will have a discussion. So just ask questions during the lecture and not me speaking with you for 90 minutes. It will be boring. Uh, so uh, I will be happy to hear. What do you think about it? This is for Malta. She is about eight years old. We'll be happy to hear your opinion about that. Are you over, overwhelmed? Do you think it's her best interest to choose her uh, gender identity, to, to change her gender identity from a boy to a girl at the age of eight or nine, something like that? What is the context of the campaign? Could you tell us more about, is it sort of- like So in Malta in 2015, they accepted a law that uh, allowed people to change the, the gender without doing health procedure. You can go to the public affairs office and say, I'm a boy, and they will change that. If you are under of the age of 18, you also can do that if your parents, under your name, filed a petition. So she cannot do at the age of eight or nine any uh, health procedure, uh, but she uh, chose to be a girl. Her parents were supportive. She cannot do that with her, her, without her parents' uh, approval. But children in Malta can choose their gender identity and she choose to be a girl. So uh, it's uh, one of the most, as I understand, even more advanced from uh, Denmark is the first and there, uh, if Malta is the first and then Denmark is the second, like when talking about trans people uh, rights. I brought it because it's amazing to see that they're giving a child at the age of eight and nine, the ability to change her gender in, in her uh, certificates and then without doing in any other country, in most of the countries, if you want to be, a, you were born as a girl and you want to be a boy, you cannot go uh, to the public affairs office or the interior office and said, I'm a boy, change that in my uh, ID. No, they will not do that. You cannot do that. If you will do the surgery, I mean, the full exchange, then they maybe will change your sex dependent. I mean, you if you don't live in Texas, for example, but in other states or countries in the world, so you can do that. So this is quite advanced. You change your gender uh, based on your own choice. But what is amazing, that this is a choice of a child. And this is what I'm interested in, children, voices, and choices. But it also uh, um, arises some dilemmas. Do you think so as well? Is that okay to give her that choice in this age? Yeah. So this is a very, very good uh, question. Yeah, so the law um, allowed you to change back and forth as long as, uh, as many times as you want, but, but this is a, uh, an important dilemma. Let's say maybe she's not mature enough to do this decision at the age of eight or nine. Maybe she will regret that. And it will be too late because she already will live as a girl for a few years and 
it's, it's a big decision. It's a, even a big decision for a grown up. Yeah. Um, I will say that I brought this video because it's um, um, it's bring us the dilemma of children's right to participation because it's not so easy. We're, we're giving children in a very young age to do choices or decisions that might be not for their best interest. And we will try to see this, uh, um, to speak about this dilemma today, but uh, thank you for your comment. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's less about the so so any concern I might have is less about her right to, you know, choose who she is and who she would like to be in the world. And my question is more about since trans issues, since this is mm -hmm. particularly what this is, on the global scale has not necessarily been recognized such that protections are in place. My questions are for this campaign, what protections were put in place for this little girl? Thank you so much for your comment, because this is the dilemma, the participation versus the protection. As social worker, we are trained, you may, may be not aware of that, but we are trained to protect children. And then I will come to you today and say, you, we also have to give them a voice. And how can we integrate or balance between protection and participation? And this is exactly the dilemma. So thank you for saying this is a very important comment. So in order for us to understand children's rights to participation, which will be uh, in the focus of my lecture today, we have to go uh, deeply inside the concept of children's rights in general. And I want us to go very early to the human history and speak about uh, children's rights in very early in the human history. So actually, uh, children's rights, it's a relatively new idea in the human history. And for most of the human history, children didn't have any rights. Okay, so for many centuries, children were considered to be the personal property of their parents, mainly the father. And parents, mainly father, were allowed to do with their children what they wish they can beat the children, abuse them, corporal, use corporal punishment, abandon them, sell them, etc. Uh, so parents, mainly father, were given unlimited power, as I said. And actually, a lot of childhood historians say that most of the children in the human history were beaten, were what we call today children at risk. And there is a very nice quote that I would like to read it to you. The father back in history once goes, the lower the level of child care, and the more likely children were to be killed, abandoned, beaten, terrorized, and sexually abused. So children didn't have any rights, even no protection rights. And there is a, this is a picture from the story of the binding of Yitzhak, when Habram brings his beloved son Yitzhak to the altar in order to sacrifice him for God. And in the last moment, he's being called to stop the sacrifice. And this is just an illustration, an example, because children were sacrificed during the, uh, the history of, human, uh, of humanity. Um, another very interesting uh, um, concept about childhood is that where there was always children in the history of uh, humanity, childhood was actually, this is what hist childhood historian, historian argue, that childhood was invented only in the 16th or 17th century. And I can show you that by those pictures, these are draws of children from the 16th and 16th century. And you can see very clearly that they are dressed like little adults. So when I mean that childhood was invented, that before the 16th or the 17th century, nobody acknowledged that children have special developmental needs, that they, have, they are different from adults. At the moment a child can walk and can talk, he was considered to be a small adult. And we didn't even have like a, a clothes for children back then. So this is the reason why children at the age of seven already started to walk. Because if they can walk, they can talk. So they are not an, any more infant. They were, we acknowledge infancy, but not childhood. Uh, so we didn't have childhood. And of course, that we didn't have the concept of children's rights. 
a big change, and this is a very important period, uh, uh, came through in during the Industrial uh, Revolution. Uh, when you can see here uh, the problem of uh, child labor, uh, when uh, um, the severe exploitation of working children led to a concern, a collective concern for children's welfare, and led to the idea that we should, as society, protect children. The Industrial Revolution, and that's connect me to the who of you talked about capitalism, brought capitalism, and it's actually brought social problems that we didn't know before, like child labor and poverty and immigration. And uh, 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 because children were very badly infected by the Industrial Revolution, especially by child labor, uh, society started to think we should protect children. And the concept of protection and well-being uh, uh, started to be discussed. And this is the, uh, the first time when we see the society giving children uh, um, rights. Which kind of rights? It was uh, protections and provision rights. For example, protection from child labor, uh, the right, of course, for public uh, schooling, for education. We, re we realized as a society back then that children should not go to work, they should go to school. It was the acknowledgement that children have special developmental needs and that they are different from adults. Healthcare, for example, and uh, a lot of other uh, uh, rights as those. By the way, this was also the first time uh, when we uh, uh, started to give children protection from parental neglect and abuse. Because before then, parents were allowed to do with the children whatever they wanted. It was not called abuse and neglect. I mean, parents were abused and neglecting the children, but the state didn't intervene inside the family in order to protect children. Now, the turning point uh, actually happened here in the USA. It was in, uh, uh, in the end of the 19th century. And this is the story of Mary Ellen Wilson. Some of you maybe know this story and want to share it with us. Who is this girl and what happened to her? We usually teach this story in the uh, courses for introduction for social work. Yeah? Yeah, Mary Ellen was a... Uh, uh living with her foster parents, and then she was subjected to uh, some very severe kind of uh, violence and also some, she had some kind of like, you know, trauma. Uh, but her parents like you know, denied her uh, to access to services and her, denied her like, you know, to even get proper food and anything like that. So I think she was, uh, she was witnessed by someone, some, some of our neighbors, and they, they saw her uh, uh, kind of like they got like some kind of information about her uh, that she is uh, mistreated with her family, and then they uh, contacted someone, but there was like a problem with the legislation, so there was animal rights uh, movement, and then the animal rights agency they cruelty of animal rights, something like that. Exactly. A help from them, and then because of them, they they were able to like you know took her away from her parents, and then I think uh, that was the starting point of uh, U.S movement for uh, child protection and i think it also uh, there was a what uh, formed a new uh, organization for child rights i think new york or us uh, association of child rights. So. this is exactly that it was excellent thank you so this is mary ellen wilson she looked like about five here but she actually she actually is standing you can see all the damage i mean the bruises and exactly as you, as you said, she was severely abused by her, by her foster care family. But I want you to understand there was no laws that was uh, uh, enabling um, the state to intervene inside the family and to put her uh, to take her out of her home. So who did this intervention was a friendly visitor. This is the first uh, kind of social worker in the world. And she came to do a visiting in the slums that this family was living in. And she saw that girl, but she was not able to take her out from her home. There was no legislation that uh, was enabling something like that. So as you said, it was quite amazing. She contacted the uh, organization against cruelty to animals. And they used laws against cruelty to animals in order to take, it, to take her out of her home. They said, she is like an animal. She needs to be protected. And uh, it was uh, coming to the Supreme Court in the USA. And her mother, she was taken out of her home. And her mother was uh, uh, giving some sentence time, uh, jail time for abusing her. It was like uh, 
revolutionary that uh, uh, back then. Uh, and it was um, amazing in the USA, but all around the world, how do we have as a society laws against cruelty to animals, but we don't have laws against cruelty to children? And this is the first time when we started protecting children from abuse and neglect of their parents. And that's why the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, it's a very important period in terms of children's rights. We started to give children protection and provision rights. This is very important. But think about that, that uh, although it was a, a revolutionary uh, period in terms of children's well-being and children's rights, children were perceived back then as passive, weak, and vulnerable creatures we are primarily in need of protection and control. So what happened in the history of acknowledging children's rights, that we understand that children are vulnerable, they are helpless, they are weak, okay, which is very important, of course. So we gave them a lot of protections rights against cruelty and abuse and neglect and provision rights, not to go to war, to go to school, to have social security and to have health, but we didn't sell them as full human beings. We didn't give them participation rights. So there was a lot of bills and conventions uh, that gave, gave children rights, but none of them uh, gave children participation rights because we didn't consider children as full human beings. We consider them as human becoming, that they will be full human beings only in the age of 18. And that was because we wanted to protect them. And this is very important because until today we have struggle a lot of struggles with the issue of children's rights to participation. But late 20s, uh, uh, we can see a more liberal view of children uh, that is emerging, and we can see an increase in awareness of children's right to participation and self-determination. So what happened in the 70s of the 20th century that there was, uh, uh, we started to give children more participation right? Um, so again, a story. One of the famous stories happened here in the USA. And this is the story of uh, Gregory Lee Kinsley. Some folks from the, from the USA know this story, maybe. I'm always uh, curious to know how much it's famous here. It's very famous in the books in Israel, in any case. So this is the first child in the history that divorced his parents. And I will say what they, do I mean by divorce. So this is, this is a real story. And there is a movie, a Hollywood movie on that. But it's a real story. So Gregory Kindley, he was 12. And he was severely abused by his parents. There was drug abuse issue, abandoned neglect. So he was uh, uh, taken out of his home. He was living in boys' home uh, shelter. And then he was taken uh, uh, by a foster family. And they wanted to adopt him, but it was not possible because his mother wanted him back. So he went to court and he filled a petition saying, I want to terminate my parents' rights. So the court says, you don't have any rights to go to court and file a petition for that. But then he uh, appealed and the court said, okay, you have a right. And this is the important thing. Then the court also decided to terminate his parents' rights, and he was adopted by this, his foster care family. But the most important thing here that the court said, you have the right, you are a full human being, and you have the right to go to court and fill a petition to terminate your parents' rights under your request. And they did terminate the parents' rights because of the abuse and the neglect. Uh, and today, of course, it's very, uh, as social worker, we're terminating parents' rights a lot in a lot of cases. But back then in the 90s, in 1993, it was again revolutionary. Um, but there was other, uh, this is just a story. So what enabled that uh, transition from, I call that, uh, uh, from, uh, sorry, from protecting children to protecting their rights, there is a vast uh, of factors that enable that. Uh, some Supreme Court uh, decisions, some academic writing, but I will give you just one example, but also influence of uh, uh, philosophical uh, people. And two of the most famous ones, it's fascinating, those are Holt and uh, Farson. So Holt write a book, a, a fascinating book. It's called Escape from Childhood because he believed that childhood is bad for most of the children. And children are not happy living in their childhood. And we need to give them a, a gate that they can go uh, outside from their childhood if it's bad for them. 
some of the children have happy childhood, but some have not. And it's written over here. Uh, however good it may be, childhood goes on far too long, and there is no gradual, sensible, and painless way to grow out of it or leave it. it he actually, and other philosophical people, acknowledge that children are being discriminated against uh, uh, in compared to adults just because of their age. And he, for example, believed that we should grant children, we should give children all the rights we're giving adults. And it's quite extreme. Okay, the right to equal treatment, the right to be legally responsible for your own life, the right to vote, the right to work, to earn money, the right to privacy, uh, the right to financially independent. It's quite extreme. Okay, the right to travel. You don't want your child to go in a bus to another state. <laughs> okay, uh, the right to receive uh, uh, from the state a minimum income. It's really, really extreme uh, thought. It was not, nobody thought that we should implement that, but it evoked the, the, the discussion. What was important about Holt and Carson Wolf and other, that it's a, a society for the first time asked why, and I find that fascinated from the first time we started to give children rights uh, uh, in the end of the 19th century until the end of, uh, we'll see that in 1989, we didn't thought that participation, self-determination, choices, decision is part of their package of rights of children. We really thought that protection and provision is enough. And children well-being can be perfect without that. And what happened uh, um, uh, during the 70s that people start asking, why do, do we deprive children from participation rights? Why? This is discrimination. We don't have any logical reason to doing that. Uh, and I think that the big change, and we all know that happened in 1989 when the convention for the first, uh, the convention of the rights of the child was uh, uh, accepted. And the convention for the first time put inside one convention all the rights for children, provision, protection, and participation. Now there was a formal convention declaration from 1958, but it included only protection and provision rights. And the, uh, the convention for the first time recognized that children are unique individuals with self-determination and participation rights. Um, now I have to ask uh, all, what is unique about the convention that all the countries world signed it, except of one country. Maybe do you know who is the only country that didn't sign the, the convention? The United States. Yeah, the United States. The only country in the world. Well, back then it was Somalia in the United States, but now Somalia already ratified and I mean, you signed it, you didn't ratify it. Do you know why? Yeah, so um, this is, uh, I think, the main reason. So one reason that I read about when I was uh, uh, during my year here, that it's, con it's something to do with the federalism, like with the abortion law now, that you do want to give independence to each, each of the states. So it's, con it's also concerned with that, that the states will have independence with regard to children's rights. But the most important uh, reason is it's what you said, it's parental rights. It's the fear that children's rights will somehow damage parental rights and children will do whatever they want. I think it's fascinating, right? Only the USA didn't sign the convention. So maybe you will. Uh, now, this is the, the end of the story of the first part of my lecture. And what, what I try to show you that although the convention doesn't give priority, okay? Provision, protection, and participation are equal important. We do have a pyramid with concern to children's rights because of the history I just shared with you. We just put more significant on protection and provision. We don't give enough um, uh, importance to participation. Now think about adults' human rights, like general human rights. What was the first rights that humans were fighting for? Like here in the USA, uh, in, the, uh, in the 17th century, for in the independence or in the North and the South War, or where, what was the first rights that human that people fight for over the history of uh, of, uh, of the human society? What are people are fighting for when we are saying human rights? 
What? Right a right to life. What else? In the French Revolution, what we were fighting for? What? The basic, needs. basic needs. Actually, basic needs is convert. I mean, it's we we are not we do not agree if the state should give basic needs to people. Some countries, more based on capitalism, said that this is the responsibility of the person. So back then, people were not fighting just for the basic needs. They they fought for their life for equal uh, treatment for uh, self determination to be free. We fought to be free. To, for our self-determination right, to be free, to be equal treated. And what is interesting that when we are speaking about human rights for adults, so the most important rights are self-determination rights, participation rights. We don't think that somebody will tell us, you don't have a right to vote. It's like, what? You don't have a right to travel. You don't have a right to choose your own life. I mean, this is the basic rights when we are talking about human rights. But when we are talking about children, the most basic rights that we are thinking when I will ask you what is human, uh, children's rights, you will first probably will say protection and provision to give them to uh, uh, that they will be safe, that they will have health, school, education, etc. And then maybe participation. They don't need participation in order to be, uh, uh, that the well-being will be uh, uh, high well-being. Okay, so this is just for us to understand that we have some dilemmas about children's rights to participation. Now let's say, try to understand together, what do I mean when I'm say, saying children's right to participation? Uh, okay, so I will base my definition of children's participation on the convention of the right of the child. And actually, when we uh, look on the convention, we actually have two aspects with regard to children's right to participation. So first of all, children's right to participation or children's participation is a general principle in the convention that address or um, concerns several self-determination rights like freedom of expression, freedom of thought and religion, freedom of association and peaceful assembly, like the, the right to do protests, the right to privacy and access to mass media. When thinking about, by the way, human uh, rights for adults, which of the self-determination of freedoms we are missing here for children, which kind of uh, other human rights from the perspective of self-determination you know that are not listed in the Convention for Children? And those are all the self-determination rights that a person need in order to, do, to live a good life. Yeah. That's, that's right, and that is coming. We'll see that in a minute. But if in terms of freedoms, which kind of freedoms human beings have in all other human rights treaties that children doesn't have? And somebody thought that they should not have it. Although the convention is very advanced and it includes a lot of uh, self-determination rights, this is a very nice list. Think about how, which kind of self-determination rights or freedoms you have and are not listed over here. For example, as I said, the, yes, yes. For example, the right to vote or the right to be elected. The right to vote is not here. The right uh, to travel, freedom of uh, transportation, because we don't want again our children to go in a bus and go to another state or another country. Okay, uh, freedom to do um, financial uh, business. We don't want children to be allowed to sign contracts because we are afraid that somebody maybe will take advantage of them. So there is a, uh, um, uh, um, we try to do a balance between protection and participation. But as you said, the most important, the other, the second part of, or the second uh, aspect of children participation, it's uh, to look at participation as an independent right. It's a uh, state in article 12. It's one of the most uh, important articles in the convention. And I will read it out loud. Uh, 
State parties should assure that the child who is capable of forming his or her own views has the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child, the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. Okay, for this purpose, the child should uh, in particular be provided the opportunity to be heard in any uh, uh, judicial and administrative proceeding affecting the child. So the simple meaning of this article is that children have a right to participate in decision-making processes that affect their lives. And this is a unique right for children. We don't have it listed in human rights treaties for adults, be not because we don't have it, because it's obvious that we have a decision-making independence. And this is, again, one of the most important articles in the convention. But you probably will agree with me that this is too abstract. We cannot, by reading this very uh, uh, short paragraph, we cannot understand when we should involve ch children in decision-making processes, why and how. And for that reason, over the years, a lot of models how to involve children or how to implement children's right to participation was developed. One of the most famous one is the ladder of participation by heart. And you can see that the ladder is divided to eight levels, which is actually divided into three basic levels, non-participation, medium participation, and full participation. And what Hart is saying that non-participation, it's, for example, decoration. I'm inviting the child to a meeting, but I'm not really giving him, and I can say, oh, he's in the meeting, but it's just decoration. It's tokenism. I'm not really giving him a space to say what he thinks, or I'm not giving him information. Let's say that we are doing a protest about something that is very important to children, and I'm inviting children, with the, and I'm giving them shirts and signs, but they didn't explain them what is the protest all about, how it's concerned to the well-being. They are just, you know, going in the protest. It's just decoration or manipulation. So this is a very important uh, part of half ladder of participation because it helps us recognize non-participation, and we have to look for that because I saw a lot of cases when the social worker is saying the child was in the meeting. The child was in the meeting, but no participation was happening. Then we have medium participation. It's when the child has, is giving information. He's given the opportunity to say his opinion, feeling, thought, views. So this is medium level, but he is not fully participate in the decision. He doesn't have influence in the decision. And the top, the full participation, is when the child is really doing decision together with adults. I think it's very interesting about heart model that is highest level is children share decision with adults. It's not children deciding by themselves. Um, now, over the years, there are plenty of other models. I just stated a few here that are very uh, relevant for social workers. And although they're like a little bit different from one each other, they are all saying the same thing. They are saying that there is continuity between non-participation to partic full participation, when the first well level will be that the child will receive information. Children need basic information in order to do decisions. They cannot do decisions if they don't know what are the topics all about. Then the child expresses his or her opinions. This is the part when the child is uh, expressing his views, thoughts, feelings. And then the third part is when the opinion is taken into account, the, 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 the um, opinions of the child influencing the decision. So this is the three competent of children participation. Do we need all three of them? I want to say to go to the end and uh, reveal the answer, no. We definitely don't. We, we cannot always uh, answer all the three uh, parts of participation, and I will try to um, uh, explain that. So um, the convention is actually saying that children's right to participation should go with accordance to their evolving capacity. This is called the evolving capacity of the child principle. And it's saying that we should give children participation with accordance to their age, Let's say that I'm thinking in Israel maybe to lower the voting age to 16. So should I compare a child in the age of 16 to a three years old child to a 20 years old adult? A 16 years old child is more uh, uh, similar to a 20 years adult and not to a three years old child. So we have to, to give different decision uh, responsibility to children by their age. 
Then there is the maturity of the specific child. Okay, two, two children in the age of 10 doesn't have necessarily the same abilities for uh, uh, receiving information and going to court maybe in divorce, divorce dispute and saying where they want to live. Okay, some children do, some children not. We have to look on the specific child. And of course, the decision, okay, the, the specific field, is that a decision about which school I'm going to? Is that a decision if I want to go to foster care or to adoption? Is that a decision about which uh, hobby I will have? It's, we have to uh, implement, to integrate between, between those uh, um, uh, three parts. And now this is a nice example. This is a picture from my son kindergarten when he was three years old. Now he's six, by the way. And they had a winter party, okay? And in the winter party, like a few days before the winter party, his kindergarten, the kindergarten teacher uh, let them choose which soup they want to be served in the, in the winter party. So we have the, my Hebrew student can read that, vegetable soup, orange soup, and pea soup. And they, they, uh, she gave them pom pons. I, I don't know why, but they choose a pea soup. I don't know. And they were <laughs> usually. And so even young, very young children can choose, but about maybe school activities. Okay, we'll not take a three year old son, a child, and put him in a review meeting in the welfare system. Now, uh, it's something very, very important for me to say. The right to participation means the right to influence and not to determine the decision. And there is a very nice quote that I really like to say, children must be given their say, but they don't always have to be given their way. And it's also with adults. I have the right to vote. I'm going to vote. I'm not imagining that somebody will tell me don't vote, but maybe the person that I voted for was not elected. I'm coming to a walk, to a meeting at work. I'm saying my opinion, but in the end, my boss will tell me, listen, I listen to you, but I don't agree. I, I'm going to decide something else. So it's not just for children. So going back to your point about the USA afraid uh, to give children rights because maybe they will choose things against their parents. It's not actually right because we are not supposed to give children all the times the decision, uh, um, um, the last decision but we have to involve them. And there is also a very important argument by Hart. Hart, Hart argued that the goal of children participation is not that children always participate fully, but every child should have the opportunity to engage in the fullest level of participation that matches his or her capacities and the second thing. Now, let me give you a very interesting example. I was doing a lot of um, training about children rights for teachers. So one of the times, it was a few years ago, one of the teachers told me the, the following story. When she was young, about eight years old, her parents suddenly moved her from her regular secular school that she was used to go to, to a religious school. And they didn't explain to her everything. And she felt very bad because all her friends was in the secular school. So every morning she's coming to school, she grasping the fence of the school, screaming and crying that she doesn't want to go in. And the parents, of course, felt very badly. After a few weeks, her mother took her and she sat with her and she said to her, and she told her, I want to explain to you why we moved you to another school. And this is because the religion school have better educational opportunities. And this is the, the, the reason why me and uh, father and uh, your father decided that. And she told me, and I cannot forget this, it was about eight years ago, that. Uh, um, the, mon the, uh, the following morning and, and father, she went to school every day, very happy. So this is a very good example of not giving the children the decision. Here, the parents took the decision. Parents of an eight years old uh, girl can choose her school. That's okay. You can still choose for your children things that you want them to have for the best interest, but they didn't get her information. And then when they gave her information, just the explanation, and they heard what she felt about that, that was enough. So this is full participation in this case, because we cannot always, let's say that we are taking a child in a review meeting, decision meeting in the welfare uh, department, and we cannot give him uh, the choice in, if to be taken out of the home, because we know that the home is very neglected and abusive. We have to take, it, to take him out. The judge already decided that. 
So we cannot ask him if he wants to go out or no, or he doesn't want to go out, but we can give him information and explain him why he has to go out from his house and to ask him how he feel about it and to give him another uh, uh, part of the decision. Uh, uh, which I will give you um, uh, some example after that. Um, are you with me until now? Is that clear? Okay. Um, okay, so we spoke about children's rights and ch children's rights to participation. And I want to go to the second part of the lecture and speak with you specifically on children's rights to participation in the child welfare system. This is, of course, what is relevant for us as social workers. So this is, again, Article 12 from the Convention. State parties should assure that the child who is capable of forming his or her own views has the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child. All matters affecting the child. What, is, what, was, uh, what has been happening in the world since the Convention was um, accepted in the end of the 80s, is that we started a society to implement children's rights to participation in various fields of children's um, um, life. For example, in health decision, in the house, in school. And uh, uh, the welfare system was also needed and should acknowledge children's right to participation because children's right to participation should be realized in all matters affecting the child. So uh, a child welfare system also was required required to acknowledge this right and to think about how can we implement this right. Now, this is very tricky and this is very challenging because the child welfare system is a structure to protect children and not to take care for their participation. And this is the challenging thing that we'll speak about it. Now, what do I mean when I'm saying children participation in the child welfare system? So it can have different uh, forms. For example, children ombudsman. Do you know what is ombudsman? Ombudsman is the organization when children can have complaints, feel complaints against bad treatment of an institution, school, their parents. So this is a way to realize children's right to participation. Of course, that uh, the the uh, if you are working in the child welfare uh, system, so you know all about lawyers for children that represent children. Uh, it can be children participation in policies and services designed, uh, but it's for most, and I will uh, be focusing on that, it's children participation in decision-making processes with regard to their own care treatment. Okay, and I will speak about that because this is the most important aspect of children participation in the child welfare context. So first of all, let's ask ourselves, why should we bring participation into the welfare system? Why do children need that? So do you have any ideas? Why do you think that we should do something like that? Why it's important to realize children's rights to participation in the child welfare system? You can base that on your own experience if some of you walk with children or just intuition. Why it's important to give children in the welfare, con in the welfare system participation rights? Yes. Sometimes the children, they know what they want more better than what we decide for them. So sometimes when we ask them, what do you want in this situation? For example, uh, divorce family. When we ask the child, what, what do you want to stay, or if you want to go to like uh, a place outside, he he would tell us what he prefer, uh, and and this may be the better option for him. So this is uh, why why uh, what is what's really it's important. Yeah. This is an excellent, excellent point. Children know better than us what they need and what they want. We cannot always give them what they want and go with their, uh, what, but we can hear and maybe we can do that. And this is excellent. It is something as adults we forget. We cannot know what the other person wants. Also with adults' clients. Children can tell us better what they want. Um, so... I will say that first of all, there is a normative factor. So this was the first part of my lecture. We should do that because if the child writes, because this is the right thing to do. 
because we uh, we don't have the um, authority to say we will give them this right, we will not give them this right. It's not it's not our decision. It's already acknowledged as part of children's rights. So this is the the normative factor, but the practical factor will be that it actually have a very good uh, influence and positive benefits for children. And there are two state of the art excellent review from about uh, one, 10 years ago, uh, and some the second more updated that found various positive effects for children participation in child protection system. I don't have a time to go all over that, but the first will be, uh, I will say two positive benefits, but first of all, it's the uh, promoting of the well-being of children. Now think about that, a child going into the child welfare system is a child with no control over his life. He didn't choose to be abused. He didn't choose to be taken out of his home. And we have the possibility to give him control back. It's part of his healing process. So this is the first factor. But the second factor is what you said, and this is the contribution to better interventions. Because I don't believe that we should realize children's rights just because there are rights, but it's also have good benefits for better intervention. Okay, for example, it was found that children's participation in decision-making about their lives help children feel connected and committed to the decision. It's actually less runaways from foster care and from shelters because they feel committed uh, and uh, connected to the um, decision. For example, children's participation in decision-making processes regarding their out-of-home placement leads to greater acceptance of placement decision and more stability in placement, less runaways. Okay, so hopefully I convince you that it's important. But, uh, oh, I, I, I can give you here a, a nice example before going to the problems. As you said, we have a lot of problems to speak about. And um, so at one point of my career, a few years ago, I was working in uh, Lawyers for Children in Israel organization. And one of the lawyers shared with me a very nice story. He was uh, represented, uh, he represented a, a girl. She was 12 years old and it was decided she will be uh, taken out of her home. It was very abusive and she had very uh, severe uh, emotional and uh, behavioral problem. So it was decided by the judge that she will go to this um, group home for, she could, couldn't go to foster care. And she refused and she said that she will run away from every place that they will take her. Now he knew as a, her lawyers that also have to represent her best interest that he cannot say that she should go out, back to her house because she was asking to go back to her house. But she, he did something very creative. He asked the social worker, which kind of houses those shelters will be good for her? And there is not a lot of those in Israel. And there was only two that uh, were good for her. One was in the north, uh, south of uh, Israel in Elat, one was in Jerusalem. And he told her, and he convinced the social worker to let her choose. He said, if both of them are good and have places, let give her the, choice, the, the, the decision just to, to choose between them because we cannot give her the choice to go back to her house. So he traveled with her to two the, of the places. They do the tour. And in the end, he asked her, where do you want to go? And she chose. And she felt so good with that, that she could choose. So this is again, full participation. He cannot give her the right to, to, uh, uh, to choose her, uh, her right to say, I, I mean, he, she has a right to say, I want to go home, but they, will not, uh, they were not able to go with that. But they did give her another kind of decision. And we can always be creative and think how we can give children the level of participation that is uh, acceptable under those circumstances. So hopefully, as I said, I convinced you that children's participation in the child welfare system is important. But the problem is the gap. We don't have a lot of countries that implement the children, children right to participation in child protection systems. And hopefully we will have enough time in the workshop. It's part of the workshop after lunch to go over that and to explore what is happening in, in your own countries. We have several countries that implements um, the Nordic countries are on the top that implement children right to participation in the child welfare system. It's actually some bits and laws saying that you cannot have a child in the care system without involving him, giving him some power of decision. Uh, we do have something in Israel, but it's not very developed. Uh, so this is just an example. I didn't do like a, a full country's walls review, but we know today that there is not a lot of countries that 
implement children right to participation in their legalization and policies. Um, we also have some international policies that state that children should be involved in child protection system, but I will not go over those. I want to go uh, to the gap. Um, um, we have today quite amount of large amount of studies examining uh, if social workers or child welfare workers, if it's in the United States, implement children right to participation. And, uh, and the results are no, not enough. So uh, when we are uh, checking research that comes from uh, child welfare workers or social workers, so they themselves report that children participation in decision-making is generally limited or not existed. And even if we, of course, study children uh, directly, we also can see that the majority of children reported they are rarely consulted and feel they have limited opportunities or no opportunities at all. Okay, so we have some children that can tell us that they were taken to foster care without knowing why they are in foster care. Or they, were, uh, uh, um, they have to meet their father in this uh, special place and they don't understand why they cannot meet their father in their father house. They don't know why, why there is a danger and why they have to meet the father in another place uh, and, and etc. And the question is uh, why? Why there is this gap? And, uh, I will try to share with you some of the um, obstacles or barriers for children participation. So generally, when we review the literature, we can find three main obstacles for children participation when it comes to social workers. First of all, perception and attitudes of professionals, and we will go deeply inside that because this is my uh, main area of research. Uh, we also have the main, the second obstacle is social workers or child welfare workers feeling incapable of uncomfortable speaking to children. Okay, so uh, I'm speaking about not people that learn to do clinical or therapy, like the caseworker that will say, no, this is not my job. This is the therapist's job. I, I don't know how to speak with the child. I don't know how to do it exactly. And the third group of obstacles is lack of human resources and time. We need time to do children participation. In Israel, uh, every social worker have, I think, 300 cases uh, overload. We also have to have a space in the, the research I did. Social workers told me that they don't have a friendly room to speak with the child. They cannot always speak with the child in his house because sometimes there is conflict. So what do we need to do? I mean, do we have friendly rooms in the child welfare department where we are working? And I will go a little bit more deeper on the time, okay, we are okay, into the perception and attitudes of uh, professionals. Uh, so, and I think this is very uh, interesting. So in general, uh, studies show us that child welfare workers and social workers tend to have a protective approach or attitude towards children's well-being in general and children's participation in particular. Okay, we actually think a social worker, this is what studies show, that we need to protect children from participation. And it's not because we are bad people, it's because I think the way that we, um, the way that they teach us social work. We took 100 years ago, as I show you, we took our, on ourselves the, the, the um, obligation or the responsibility to protect children from abuse and neglect. We're so concerned with the protection that we don't have enough uh, uh, space for the participation. Uh, also, we can see that studies showing that a lot of uh, professionals, uh, I mean, social workers, think that children doesn't have the abilities to say what they think and to participate in a way that they will keep their best interest. And I will give you an example from a study I did. This was uh, in my PhD. So I presented children, okay, not from the child welfare department, unfortunately, like general children, parents and social workers, uh, a list of stories, uh, like short vintage stories, where there is a child that tried to implement his right to participation, and in the other side, there is an adult that tried to prevent him to realize his right. So let's take an example. The old parents want him to attend a particular school because they heard good things about it, but Ro would like to go to a different school because it's offered special art course that he is interested should Dro have the right to decide which school he agrees he will go to? And I uh, share, uh, and I ask uh, the professionals, the parents and the children 
to go to, I will go off from the camera for one second. Uh, so you can see I, I presented 16 uh, stories. So this is like about uh, uh, five of the stories, uh, the right to demonstrate, the right to participate in, uh, in discussion in the Ministry of Education. But in any of the stories, you can see that this is the percentage of children, parents, and social workers that agree or agree a lot that the child in the story should have the right to decision. And you can clearly see that children agree to a larger, to a larger extent that they should have the right to, to decide than the parents and in the end, the social workers. Okay, it's, it's, it's about uh, 700 children, about 200 parents and 150 social workers in Israel that works with children, only social workers. I study only social workers that uh, work with uh, children. And then I also um, introduce them with stories, especially about the child welfare context. For example, let's read the, uh, the life story. Omri suffered from physical and verbal violence from his parents. Therefore, the welfare services decided to remove Omri from his home. Omri doesn't want to leave his home. Omri should have the right to take part in the decision regarding leaving his parents' home. And again, children thought to a large extent that they should give the right to, this, to, to participate in the decision, then the parents and then the, uh, uh, the social worker. But in any case, there is a big gap between the adults and the children. And those are social workers that works with children. And again, it's not because they are bad, because I think that we, they really believe that that, that cannot be, it, the, the child doesn't have the ability to do that, or it will maybe uh, damage his well-being or will be conflict with his best interest. Uh, I will go over that because I want to. Um, here I compared between regular social workers and child protection social worker. We call them in Israel legal social workers. And you can see that uh, uh, legal social worker, this is the child protection uh, social workers that really work with the abused and neglected children, uh, support children right to to participation less than general child welfare social worker. So the more your work is inside the protection with the abused children, the less you believe in participation. And I think it's exactly the conflict between protection and participation that we don't have in social work a theory that will help us do both because we are being taught by uh, other theories. And I have right because you did spoke so I want to give the as a to give you some uh, time to ask questions so I will go to my third part just for five minutes and then uh, leave some space for questions and discussion uh, I want to say something general about social work and children rights or maybe social work and human rights and I will say maybe that um, um, I was for seven years a clinical social worker and then I moved to be uh, to work in an organization for children rights in Israel uh, and I think that the uh, clinical and direct work with children and family are very, uh, is very important. But I want to speak about the relationship between social work and human rights. And I want to recommend, and I can send you the article. It's actually a chapter, an amazing chapter that was written by Shirley Geten Geteneo Gable. She's from New York. She's a social worker. And she's a, she, have a, she writes a lot about uh, human rights and social work. And we wrote with her uh, a book about children's rights and social work. She has a series of books, children's rights and social work, women's rights and social work, human rights and social work, workers' rights and social work. And uh, in this series, in the introduction, she has a very special chapter about the relationship between the social work professions and human rights. And she actually... You have a question? No, just raise your hand. Okay. She actually is saying that we can uh, identify three approaches in social work charity based approach to treat people, to help people, need based approach, and right based approach. The charity based approach was in the beginning of social work when we started the uh, charity organization, when a wealthy women went to poor people and uh, educate them how to behave better. And there was wealthy people to get help and unwealthy people, it was uh, blame the client, let's call it like that approach. Now it's not in the history. You can still recognize organization in social work that work under the charity-based approach. 
in any case, for example, social security in any case in Israel. Needs-based approach, this is much more advanced. This is saying that we have scientific uh, research that show us what are the needs of the people. We are, are the professionals. We, we learn the needs of the people, do assessment. And then we say, okay, what this person needs based on those uh, assessments. It's all scientific. But this is again, according to uh, Gateneo, it's based on the deficit model, that there is something wrong with the person. And I'm choosing, I'm saying what is his needs and I'm saying what he needs in order to feel better. I'm not asking him what he needs. And white-based approach is actually to help people. It's actually saying that as social worker, our need or our um, purpose is to help people realize their rights. We don't have any um, um, authority to tell them what they need. Maybe they will choose something bad, but they have the right to choose something bad for themselves. And we just have to help them uh, get empowered and realize their rights. So this is in general. Going to, uh, um, going to children's rights and social work, it's a more interesting story. It's a very interesting story because actually in the beginning, in the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, in the beginning of social work profession, the first social worker was fighter, were a fighter for children's rights. They were working to promote children's rights. So I have some example. This is a, a Eglit in Jeb. She's, from, she's a British social reformer, the first uh, kind of social workers. She founded Save the Children Organization. It exists at present until today. And she known at drafting the document that became the Declaration of the Rights of the Child from 1924. Or for example, we have Julia Latrop that in 1912 president, um, she was appointed to be the head of the Children's Bureau that I know that exists in the USA until today. And she fought uh, for uh, juvenile rights and against uh, child labor. Um, so we see a lot of social workers in the beginning of the social work profession fighting for children's rights. But after that, we call it the dark period, we had to start protecting children. And this is when the Save the Children approach was developing the social work. Okay. And we started to see the child as an object of protection and not as a person with rights. And we use more control and supervision uh, over children, maybe um, institutalize them, uh, et cetera. Then there is another phase, uh, the child developmental approach that again, it's like the need-based approach. In the 70s, we see a lot of theories of Fiaget and Erickson and cohort and all of those uh, psychologists saying what children needs in order to fully develop. And we see uh, that the social workers started to, to develop a, an area of expertise, which called child care, child development. But this is based again, this is very important. What I'm saying is nothing instead of that, okay? This is of course, a very important phase, it's saying that uh, um, um, we need to find out what the child needs and to give it to him. However, as a royalty, the child was still seen by this approach as weak and vulnerable, and there is no reference to the child's status as a full human being in those theories. And parents are the direct customers of the welfare services under this approach. So we will give service to a child, but we will speak with his parents and will not consider his own uh, voices and wishes. Um, I think this is a very important quote. It was assumed that the best interest of the child could be assured only by professional experts with scientific training in emerging personality theories and child developmental qualify them to choose and monitor the type and quality of care for the child. Even today, many professionals see themselves as the expert who best know what is in the best interest of the child and many professionals refuse to consider the strengths and competencies of the child itself. And in the end, we have children's rights approach. Uh, uh, in social work, which is, of course, a, a full course, just to learn that. But um, I will suggest in, in, in general, it's, uh, 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 it's to move uh, from children needs to children rights. How can we as social worker address not just what the child needs, but what is his rights? And today, uh, we can say that today, more and more children are being recognized as independent beings 
with their own in the interest and need uh, representation and also a consultation. Uh, so we don't have both enough um, uh, time to go uh, into that, but to work on a children's rights approach in social work means to uh, treat children as full human beings with full human children rights uh, at least, and especially realizing children's right to participation along with their protection and provision, not instead of. Okay, and I will finish my talk here. I will uh, leave that uh, slide open because I do want to give some, I did speak, spoke uh, <laughs> for 17 minutes. So maybe now we have some time for questions and then I will ask you something about that slide. So, thank you. So comments and questions, and then we will try to address that as well. I'm going to bring around the mic, or otherwise it, of course. Won't, it won't be recorded, so it'll be, if that's okay. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Wait. Yeah, if we can just speak close to the mic, and that way it'll be recorded. Um, <clears throat> I'm more a community worker, but um, we try to, to help children to get into collective organization and action. And what <clears throat> you presented is more about individuals. And I was wondering about collective participation, because I think um, we are not good. <laughs> where I live, um, to think like uh, the context. Uh, usually children are sitting on adult chairs. They don't have a space for them, um, which is thought with them to, even in the playgrounds, they don't have much word for what they want. Um, so I was wondering if there is something about it. Yes, I'm coming right back. Um, thank you for asking this question because it's another uh, field of expertise that I didn't show you here. When we are talking about children participation, we have two sorts or two types of participation. The, the first type will be the individual child participation. I hope that it will go through just a second. So the first step is the individual child participation about his own life, but the other type is children participation as a group in decision that does not concern specifically their individual lives, but in decision that influence the, the group of children in general. Uh, so that could be in the state level, in the international level, in the city level. And I think your example is wonderful. Playgrounds, we don't need them to go and maybe have like to choose the next politician, just to choose how they want their playground to be look like. And just to have committees with children and to ask them which kind of playgrounds do you want. This is the most less developed participation of children. If we are seeing more and more countries that implement children's right to participation in individual decision, we see less countries implement children's right to participation in the public sphere, in the political sphere, when a child can influence a decision that's related to all, the, all children's lives in his city, in his school, in his boarding school. Uh, I think that connected to child welfare, by the way, I think that children should be participate in services development. In, in When we are uh, in Israel, for example, uh, developed the foster care law, we did involve some children, foster care children that can say what is wrong and what is uh, not wrong, what is good. So it's, a, it's very important. I didn't address it in my lecture, but there, it's a very important aspect of children's participation. So thank you for that. Yes.
Okay. Thank you. Um, I, as you were talking, I found myself kind of um, thinking back to um, children from marginalized communities and um, their basic needs met before we can move to participation, because in a lot of the lectures we've been having, we've been talking about the marginalization of certain um, groups and, um, you know, the who occupies spaces, right? And how marginalized groups are not always included in, in spaces where they should be. So in the context of children, it came up for me when you talked about um, the American context um, and you know the, the child that was removed from their parents because of the abuse. And um, I thought back to how though that you know, within like colonial white society, that might have been the first incidence, but in the American context and as well as the Canadian context, there was residential schools and Indian day schools during which um, children were removed, uh, indigenous children were removed from their parents and how that infringed on their rights, um, you know, to life, uh, safety and, and liberty before we can move towards um, the right to participate. Um, and within your context, within Israeli uh, society, um, it also made me think about the um, rights of Palestinian children. And so like, for example, like a recent um, example that's been in the news a lot is the story of Ahmed Manasra, who is a Palestinian child who was um, imprisoned and tortured um, and deprived of his right to medical care by the Israeli um, government um, since he was 13 and he's now 20 and Amnesty International released a report stating that um, the Israeli government has transgressed against his, um, his rights under the um, Convention for, for the Rights of the Children, um, the UN Convention. So I guess I wanted to ask you before we can move to participation, what um, what's the dialogue around um, the ensuring children have their basic needs met and that their needs are um, you know, the, the, there needs to be protected, the rights to be protected and their basic needs met, um, such as, you know, the, the rights of Israel or Palestinian children living under Israeli occupation. It's an excellent question because I want to raise here a dilemma. So there is two perspectives to human rights. One perspective is saying, if you will have freedoms, you will have your basic needs. Actually, the United States system is based on that. We'll give you freedom. We don't need to give you basic needs. If you will have freedom, you will be able to uh, go to the free market, walk, because you are free. You are not discriminated. You are free opportunities. This is one approach for human rights. The second approach for human rights is saying, no, this is bullshit because there is a lot of, sorry to speak like that, yeah. there is a lot of uh, discriminated groups and to give freedom to a Palestinian child that is in jail or to give freedom to Indian child at his boarding school and he didn't choose to be in boarding school, this will not help him uh, have his uh, basic needs. And uh, so this is a, a, just a general comment about that, that we are still fighting as scholars, as human rights people, what is the right way to do that? And the second thing that I want to say, I don't think that we should first do uh, um, basic needs and then participation. You said we first need, this is the whole problem, because this child, I will be happy to hear in the break about those, uh, on this story, because one of the problems in Israel that we will not hear, nothing that has happening with the Palestinian people, so it will be interesting to hear. You, I didn't hear about this story, so this is another problem that we don't have uh, time to speak about. Um, so I will be happy to hear more about it, but this child actually have a problem, not for his basic needs, for his, his, his discrimination, he's being discriminated because he's a Palestinian, his, uh, his freedom, he doesn't have his freedom, it's not even basic needs. So I don't think that we should say first basic needs and then freedom, we have to find a theory, practical tools and ways to realize children both basic needs and participation, because sometimes the first approach will work, that we will give them freedom. If the child will have this, his freedom, maybe he can protest and he can have his basic needs. Sometimes children need first their basic needs and then uh, only uh, their participation. And I think that we should avoid this pyramid saying first basic needs and let's go to the Indian children. So Children are being, when children are coming from a marginal group, they are being discriminated or marginal twice. First of all, because they are children. I want you to understand that children are being discriminated just uh, um, based on their age, because they are not 18. They are liars, 
we call the children liars, they, they, are, they have bad behaviors. We really, we really have some bad negative attitudes sometimes towards children just because they are children. We really think there is a lot of, here in the United States, we think it's legitimate to, to use corporal punishment against children. So this is the discrimination against a person because of his age. It's like to discriminate a person because of his gender because of his religion is to discriminate a person because he's under the age of 18, he's less than a person, he deserves less of respect. And then if he's an American Indian, he's a, he's a, he's a Palestinian in Israel, so he's being marginalized twice, once for his age and then and the second time because he's uh, belonged to a marginal group. And we have to find a solution and we have to help those children realize their rights, all their rights, provision, protection and participation together. Uh, and it's it's complicated. I, of course, I agree with you. But when I see a very hungry child, he needs to have food. But maybe the reason for him not having food is him not having freedom. So I have to open myself just to give him a bowl of soup will not help him. Maybe he's being discriminated. Maybe he's being marginal. Maybe somebody put him in foster care where nobody heard heard his story. Maybe he should be in another place, and then there he will have food. So I think it's a good question. It's a very, uh, I will be happy to hear more about the story that you just, uh, interested to, to hear how uh, the uh, Israeli uh, used the convention on the right of the child for this case. We have yes. time for questions? Okay. Yes. Um, so how many more questions do we have? I wonder, um, I think it's, I think it's, it feels important to, to maybe gather some questions and then if you could address, would that be okay? So I think we can, we can gather the remaining questions and then what we can do after the lunch is if you, you know, jot down any ideas that we're, we weren't able to mention here and we'll continue because we have the afternoon also with um, Dr. Kosher. <clears throat> hey, what did I do with the other? We'll gather. Uh, first of all, thanks for your sharing. I'm Charlotte from Hong Kong, and your sharing is very inspiring. And my question is, I once working as a social worker or caseworker in a family uh, service center setting under the government social welfare department. And we do have a uh, law called child and protection order to file by a social workers in case of we are fighting children are being abused by their parents but the dilemma is we also often find that uh, once we file a child and protection order we can remove the children from their uh, original families to foster caring system and get a better life or so on but the problem is often because the children are so small and we have a very strong family solidarity culture in Asian uh, culture. And the children is love their papa and mama and they don't want to go to the foster care ring or leave their parents. But from our professional perspective, they are the children are in, are in danger and they are beat by their parents, they are hurt by parents. So we often, believe that the children's safety is the first, but from the children perspective, they will think that why you remove us from our parents and they got so confused and they don't want to leave their parents. So I know, I know, I know they ha do have their own rights to make their decisions, but once if this decision is, 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 is maybe is harmful to themselves. So I often have no idea what should we do. Yeah, but we still uh, follow the protocol and just do the procedures. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna just, if you, yeah, if we can take notes and then I will gather a question that we have on, on the on stack here. So, and then I'll, thank you. Um, mine's a really quick one. I just want to know who do you, how do you define what a child is and who is a child um, when it comes to participatory rights? Um, I feel like in some cultures, children, like in an Indigenous Australia, children are recognised up to 28. 
Um, and adult, like people who are 90 will refer to their children, their children will be 50 something. So how do we define a child? And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the binary of the adult and the child and how that serves as like a model of control, even speaking like, who do we give rights to? It always comes back to adults determine. So, yeah. Oh, great question. Um, let's see, Bobby. So I'm just going to go in order of the classroom. Sorry. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation. I just wanted to know, like we discussed, uh, uh, we say participation is the right to influence the decision, but not to make the decision. But I wanted to know how well do you think this influence stands in front of the larger dominant voice of the adult majority? Like, do you have some uh, concrete examples that showed that this uh, method of participation has made some changes in terms of the decision that the children are faced through? Kind of going back to the data that was presented on the slide of social workers' opinion around child agency versus their parents versus the child themselves, those, those three bar graphs, I was particularly stricken just by the fact that social workers in many of those cases were below parents in thinking that ch children should have agency in decision-making. Um, so I'm curious, just like, if, if that was like a, a study in the Israeli context, like how this research actually can affect change within the Israeli context. And I guess more, more broadly stemming from that, like what critical social work looks like in Israel, like, like how research is interpreted and changes the, the, the discipline over time, or sorry, not the discipline, but the profession over time. And like how, what role social workers have in, in being critical um about the own system that they participate in question yes. uh, sorry. sorry uh thank you professor for your presentation i have one quick question and that's related to the child's participation in the start of your presentation you shared an example of a child's uh right to uh to to kind of uh their her right of I think uh, kind of like to where she wants to be like or how, how she wants to be like that. And we all uh, kind of celebrated that uh, her choice and we appreciate her choice. But I wonder uh, uh, how child participation looks like in cases such as like a uh, child's uh, uh, choice to go for the marriage before turning to 18 and how child agency uh, looks like to you and to child uh, practitioners when it comes to something they choose, uh, which is not kind of like a popular culture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, so what I might propose is maybe get, like attempt to, to have some sort of answer that we can close with, and then we can come back to these, um, you know, we will continue the conversation after lunch so that we also don't eat too much into your but to answer. I think that it will be difficult to give one answer to all the questions. So maybe I will just give one answer and then I will answer the rest of the question in the workshop. Sure. That's it. That's that I don't care also to answer all the questions, but it will take the time of your lunch and then I will not be so much more popular. If I'm popular now, I prefer to keep it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I will just go to the last questions uh, and answer that, and then I will be very happy to answer the, your excellent, excellent question in the in the in the beginning of the workshop. So you ask a very uh, good question for me to close the lecture. So that's why I'm choosing your lecture. You ask about if, uh, how can we give, for example, a child the right to choose to be married under the age of 18? And I will tell you something. I was working in the National Council of the Child. It's an advocacy organization for children's rights in Israel for a lot of years. And we fought to change the marriage law. And we succeeded. It was 17 in Israel. And we succeeded to uh, make, make it 18. 
And I'm saying this is a full rights approach. And I'm saying that because what I try to show you in the, in the presentation that we have to balance between children protection and children participation. The challenge is that the convention doesn't give us answers how to do that. This is one of the big critics on the convention. The convention put a list of rights, but she doesn't tell us how to balance between the protection and the participation. So a child should be protected, protected from early marriage. Okay, so this is one. But on the other hand, he can come to his parents and say to them, I want to get married. And we have to find a balance. And this is what is very complicated. We don't have answers. Maybe in a few years, you know, we're now speaking about the disappearance of childhood. We know that children can earn a lot of money in a very early age now. So maybe uh, the, co the convention will be uh, rewritten or we will have to change that. Maybe in 100 years, it will be acceptable to be married again in the age of 16. But at the moment, it, we, uh, I think that there are some areas where we should protect children. But, and you know, I will take another half of, of question. You ask about uh, uh, the, the child and it's connected to your question that he loves his parents. He has to be back to them, but they abused him. So this is exactly, again, the balance and the, the level of participation. I will hear the child. First of all, I have to hear him with full respect. Please tell me what do you think? And please tell me why it is so important for you to go back to your parents. Do you understand what happened? Do you understand that we are very concerned? And then I will decide to put to take him to first again. And I will sit with him and I will explain him the decision. I will tell him, you know, I heard what you want, but we and the judge, we decided something else. And I want to explain you why. And it's okay that you are angry. And I, I, I can feel that you do not agree with me. This is full participation. And I promise you that in six months, we will have another review meeting and we'll see maybe your parents are doing better because we know now that they are going to trainings. So this is exactly full participation. Participation is not saying to ask the child, do you want to go back to your parents and uh, uh, make them and then say, okay, go back to your parents. Participation is to respect the child, hear his voice and explain him the decision, even if the decision is against his will. And this will uh, enlarge the, the, uh, um, the, the, the chance that the child will be committed to the decision. Going back to your question about uh, marriage, listen, I don't know, let's say now all the children in the world will do a protest that they want to be married at the age of 17. I don't know, I'm open to everything. Now, based on the research, it's not good to be married under the age of 18. This is what we learned in Israel in any case, but uh, who knows? And if my child will come to me at the age of 17 and said he wants to be married, so I can, if I decide that he will, cannot be married because in Israel, a parent can like file a petition that his child will be married before the age of 18. I guess I hear that it's very important to you. Let's do a, a B, and C, but no, you will not be married. I, I'm hearing your voice. You will be able to do that at the age of 18. And I want to explain you why. It's different from saying you cannot be married because you don't have this right and just go to your room. So it's, it's a balance and we have to work on that. All the time we have to work on the balance. And there is a, still three questions that I can, I will be very happy to answer them after the break. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Kosher and also really wonderful questions and brave questions that I think are important for this learning space. And so let's continue um, into the afternoon to, to speak about these issues with radical empathy, um, collective dialogue, and embracing those, you know, our, our learning commitments to, to work together and to think about these very challenging issues. Thank you so much. I think this is wonderful. <laughs>